ghosts are a vibe, but how are they as an element? You can call me Nordis, and I've been here making my own collection of creatures for the past few years based off of STEM topics. And ever since I decided to make a game with these guys, I've been trying to express my thought processes of various video game tropes and mechanics as I'm still coding the game. Now, the largest franchise of this genre, Pokemon, has reportedly been quite the boogeyman as of late. So we'll discuss how an elemental ghost type was treated before and after Pokemon's conception, along with Pokemon's own definition of the type, before I close out the video talking about my own plans and showing you yet another Zodiac beast. So listen real closely, don't make a sound, cause today, we're talking about ghosts. Did Pokemon invent the ghost type? I wouldn't say so. I mean, what purpose do types serve in Pokemon mechanically? To categorize characters and their moves. Earlier role-playing games had playable characters centered around the undead, like being a necromancer in Dungeons and & Dragons. And even outside of games, there are plenty of media using spirits as an attack or identity. But let's stick to video games. The Megami Tensei series is often attributed to be one of the first monster tamers, where the creatures were all demons. That's already kind of adjacent to ghosts. But Megami Tensei demons come in a variety where they are taxonomically categorized. And turns out, there is a spirit species. So we see some of the first instances of using ghosts to describe a type of creature, at least in a monster tamer. Similarly, the Dragon Quest series have an undead family within their bestiary, as a larger family of RPGs often had ghosts as common encounters. So cool, we see ghosts and adjacent terms being used to describe a character's theme, but what about ghosts having their own elemental attack? When looking up games with elemental categories, I did stumble across an old RPG called Paladin's Quest, where there's a heavenly element, but there's also a spirit spell, which was like the ultimate type that was learned after all the other types of spells. And when it comes to RPGs, well, the first Final Fantasy apparently had this Dia type, which specifically targeted the undead. I guess this is kind of like a ghost themed element? But there was supposedly a mind element in these first few games, which later got translated in 2021 to mean spirit. I'll be honest here, I'm not too familiar with this franchise, and from what I've seen, most of these moves feel like special conditions rather than dealing elemental damage. But the following games of the series lean more into the spiritual interpretation with the fleshed out and recurring holy and dark elements. Speaking of light and dark, the spiritual element is often split between good and bad, like in Yu-Gi-Oh with their light and dark attributes, along with the divine attribute which was a dominating element like the spirit spell in Paladin's Quest. And additionally, the Robopon series would also have holy and evil attributes on top of their stat defining types. So this is a time period when Pokemon's first games would be released, where we've seen that many of these other Japanese games have mentioned ghosts as common encounters and or elements for certain spells. So how did Pokemon define their own ghost type? Ghosts were a special case in Pokemon. Unlike the other types, the Ghost and Dragon type were each relegated to just one line of Pokemon in the first game. Not unlike how we saw Spirits be treated like an ultimate type before. But while Dragon's type matchups suggest their dominance, they are more of an endgame surprise or a sneaky prize for gambling. gambling. Ghosts on the other hand, specifically provided flavor to a certain spooky chapter of the story. Lavender Town's tower had to face a completely new type who cannot be hurt by normal and fighting moves. Now, this type had their own moves, but in the first game, ghost moves were pretty limited. So ghosts were only technically an elemental type, but they were so rare it's like it was just a special exception for the ghastly line, who is also a poison type. But thematically, ghosts were like the antithesis to the normal type as they were both immune to each other. Furthermore, Ghastly and Haunter are guests that are slowly materializing until you get to Gengar, who's listed as the shadow Pokemon. But the shadow of whom? A popular fan theory is that they're a shadow of Clefairy, who was supposed to be the face of the series before it was given to Pikachu, and guess what? Clefairy in this generation was a normal type. So ghosts are like the shadows of normal life, right? 
But hold on, the next game introduced the dark type. What's the difference between shadows and the darkness? Alright, I'm just kidding. If you didn't know, the dark type is only called that in the English translation, while in the original Japanese translation, it's more of the evil type. So is this more like a light versus dark kind of a theme? Eh, I wouldn't exactly call Gengar a saint. And the second generation's Mistrevis only cements the ghost type to represent the undead. Now, while this light versus dark trope did exist in the Pokemon card series, there wouldn't exactly be a light type in Pokemon until maybe it was Generation 6 with the fairy type, which is not exactly about being morally right, but it's the closest we got so far. Now the line between dark and ghost types would get even more blurred in the shadow Pokemon phenomena, which weren't in the main series games, but they were the main plot point of Pokemon Colosseum and Pokemon XD Gale of Darkness. Shadow Pokemon are rendered to be uncharacteristically heartless and cruel, as opposed to dark type Pokemon who are naturally jerks. Now, while no Pokemon had the Shadow type, as it's more of a condition that slapped onto their regular typing, Shadow Pokemon got access to a special set of moves which always dealt neutral damage in the first game, but in the latter, they were always super effective, and only resisted by other Shadow Pokemon. It's frankly a very interesting twist on a main game's mechanics. By the way, I kinda wish we had more special designs of the Shadow Pokemon, in addition to the iconic Shadow Lugia, and later Pokémon's Shadow Mewtwo. Like, they brought a similar mechanic back in Pokemon Go, where every Shadow Pokemon had red eyes and a purple haze around them. I mean, I took a crack at drawing a Shadow Delcaddy and a Shadow Burnett, based off of the Black Cat trope and Shadow Puppets, respectively. I could only dream, I suppose. But yeah, while Shadow Pokemon were never a thing in the main series, future moves that use Shadow-related terms were often given to the Ghost type instead of the Dark slash Evil type. But Shadow Tag the ability is more often associated with Psychic Pokemon. I mean sure, Shadow Tag doesn't affect Ghosts, but Ghosts can get away from nearly all binding abilities. I just mentioned this because there seems to be a bit of an overlap between the Psychic and Ghost themes as they can both play with the mind. While the main definition of Pokemon's ghost type seems to be about the undead and the multiple cultural depictions of spirits, ghosts seem to have some wiggle room, as some could easily also be dark, fairy, or even psychic type. Like what makes Armor Rouge psychic instead of ghost like Cerulege? Aren't they both wearing haunted armor? And if the armor's description has anything to do with it, why doesn't the malicious armor raise a dark type? Don't get me wrong. Pokemon's ghost type is probably my favorite type as it holds creatures with the most creative body plans. It's fun to make designs who aren't tethered to the physical mortal realm. And that's why many other games seem to also have this ghostly theme. So we saw how ghosts were a common creature you can encounter and sometimes use as a special spell. Then we saw how Pokemon over time decided to flesh out their ghost type into a common element rather than a special case. But what about games later in the 21st century? Coromon has a ghostly elemental type to describe both creatures and certain moves. But in Monster Sanctuary, the creatures are categorized taxonomically, like in Megami Tensei and the Dragon's Quest games, where type here refers to the kind of species instead of an element. And lo and behold, there's a spirit type. Ooblets doesn't have a type system as far as I know, but they do have a spooky area where you can collect ghoul-themed creatures. Similarly, my singing monsters have several islands dedicated to ghostly and spooky themes. Then there's a few games where the entirety of their roster are kind of ghosts. The creatures of Yokai Wash are all supernatural beings, and several of their tribes would accentuate different aspects of being a ghost, from mysterious to eerie. Moonstone Island doesn't have a ghostly element, but all of their creatures are referred to as spirits. And then there's Photogeist, which is about taking snapshots of various ghosts referencing multiple cultures. So yeah, while I focus more on the creature collectors as I'm working on one, look at the variety of ways ghosts can be included in games. From being a category of spells, to affecting creature designs. So, what do I want to do?
Look, I enjoy ghostly themes. I even previously justified using a Phasma type to stand for the unknown and imperceivable. And while I don't think Pokemon invented having ghosts in a game, I already decided a few months ago to represent phantoms in a different way, regardless of any current use. You see, Ever since I decided to have categories assigned to certain stemma, where the species of a category all have a unique property in the overworld and or in battle, why not have an intangible category that can always ignore null and fort of physical attacks? What if they can be used to pass through some walls in the overworld? Okay, it's gonna be a long time until I figure out and code what they actually do, but still. I have other types to reference the spirits, as with this change, I'm satisfied with my 15 types now, especially with how 5 of my types loosely represent the common phrase body, mind, and spirit. Forta and Toxa represent what one can do, reflecting on the physical and chemical split between the attacks I have. And then Neura is about logic and the theoretical, though I need to make sure not all the math-based stemma are Neura type. Finally, Umbra and Chroma are what other games would call dark and light. Now the reason why I'm not using Luma or a light type for now is because I think it overlaps with the illuminating properties of Pyro and Electro. So Chroma meaning color is all about variety and the whimsical wonders that one can experience either from producing or reflecting light, while Umbra is more about utilizing the shadows and the lack of one's perception. The type matchups are being workshopped and they'll continue to be worked on as the game develops, but yeah. In contrast to before, this is my decision to graduate the Phasma theme into the intangible category. Now before I end this video, let me tell you a ghost story. So I've been slowly showing off my Zodiac Beast, a set of designs I drew a few years ago. These guys are not planned to be a part of my main stemma project, as I really need to reduce my scope. They're just 12 designs that are loosely based off of the Zodiac. but. They're actually about various niche STEM topics. So today's Zodiac Beast is loosely referencing Scorpio. Hmm, according to the horoscope, if you're a Scorpio, you will have a nice day today. But yeah, about the ghost story. There once was a town called Stone Lily. It was a wet town with a constant overcast. Their inhabitants were quiet and spent their days with the head down, for they believed that looking at the heavens would be insulting them. Little did they know, this guy was planning to meet them regardless. On the darkest night under the cold autumn breeze, the sky crackled as a sliver of the heavens pointed towards the ground. And that sliver grew and grew. A young citizen of Stone Lily was awakened by the ruckus and dared to challenge the skies as they looked above, only to be met by a giant hand slowly descending upon the town. Their scream would awaken the townspeople. Some ran away, some approached the hand in curiosity, but they were all too unaware to realize the dire situation. The heaven's hand clasped and pointed a finger downwards that eventually touched ground. The floor was immediately cursed, the power emanating from the finger petrifying any poor soul like a touch. Panic set as the onlookers finally realized what plans this guy had. Ripples of frost would catch up to the fleeing onlookers, making statues out of their futile escapes. The curse would eventually envelop the town. Stone Lily would earn their name that day, as their inhabitants were quiet and spent their remaining days frozen in place. This was an exaggerated tale of the Brinical Phenomenon, aka the Finger of Death, where the sea near the polar regions would freeze, but the freezing water leaves salt behind, so that concentrated brine would escape the floating ice. However, if the brine is cold enough to freeze surrounding water, yet not cold enough to freeze itself, it will continue to sink towards the sea floor, forming a tube of ice around it. When they finally reach the ground, the surrounding areas would also be frozen, often trapping some wildlife in the process. So here's Bernipio, my design based off of the Brinicle. They usually float on top of the seawater as they reach down to claim their victims. As always, if you want to learn more about the Brinicle, I'll link several topical videos in the description below. Ooh, ghosts are definitely a cool theme. It's no surprise to find this element that's prevalent in nearly every culture appear in media, including video games. Even though I'm no longer planning on having an element based off of the unknown, 
I'm trying to reference it through a separate category, as I approach the spiritual theme with more of a light and dark trope. Though, since my whole game is STEM based, it's more like having colorful wonders and imperceivable shadows. Anyways, these are the plans I'm currently working on, and if you're interested in seeing my progress and or like hearing discussions like these, follow the channel! Got a whole playlist here going over my project. I want to thank my Patreon supporters for their direct support of the channel and my project, but you can support me for free by just liking and sharing this video. So thank you for watching this spooky video, and I hope, Scorpio or not, you can realize how to stay safe.